I should start with the official bounded context definition. In Entity Framework, modeling is an important part of our language. However, many developers approach their application with a single model that's meant to represent the entire application. With a bounded context, the goal is to make sure that your model isn't overreaching. Instead, you may need multiple models for your application, each one delimited by how it applies to a particular area of functionality. So to begin with, the bounded context delimits the applicability of a particular model. By defining the bounds of a model, it allows developers to know what they should focus on and what is out of bounds for them to work on. In his book, Eric gives an example of a team finding an existing class that's used for tracking financial transactions, a charge. That charge class was defined for a particular function in the application. But since this team also worked with something related to charges, they decided to use the existing class, but then tweaked it to support their needs which, of course, caused chaos in the other application feature. So you can see that with this example, not only are boundaries critical, but also the communication. Again, from the DDD book, I love this way of thinking of bounded contexts, like cells. Not only does each cell do the job it's responsible for, but there's an important part of bounded contexts. They often need to share information. In the cells, the membranes define what can pass and how that can happen. In DDD, there's a concept of integration between two models, and the integration doesn't happen by accident. It's well planned, but its implementation is not a concern of the context. This is where I need to remind you that this is a course on Entity Framework, not on domain-driven design. So I'll show you a pattern for sharing common objects between contexts, but I won't be digging into the various integration patterns defined in DDD. Now let's look more closely using an easy to comprehend domain. Keep in mind, while the pattern I'm talking about is suited for large enterprise applications, you can also benefit from it in smaller applications as well. For the sake of demonstration, I'll focus on a narrower domain, one to do with sales. So let's say these are all the things we're concerned with in our application. Customers, orders, line items, shippers, etc. When defining an entity data model and entity framework, we often just create a single context to expose all of those classes. Here's how that might look in code. I have a DB context that exposes a DB set property for every single one of those classes in my application. Every time I work with a context, I'm involving every single class, even those classes which have nothing to do with the task at hand. Imagine if you had hundreds of classes in your domain. Not only would it be a chore for us to even look at this class, but at runtime, the application has to do a lot of work to build its in-memory representation of the model. Granted, that only happens once for the application process, and with Entity Framework, there are plenty of things you can do to minimize the performance hit. But the bigger problem here is about application maintenance, which could become a nightmare. So if you look at this more closely, you may ask yourself questions like, well, what does salary history have to do with order shipments? Or are the same people who take sales orders going to be handling returns? The more you think about these things, the more you'll be able to perceive models that are bounded by the context in which they'll be used. This may be a little exaggerated, but you can see what I mean about the various contexts. Within the context of creating a marketing campaign, does the user need access to salary history or to edit a customer? When a user is processing a return, do they need to change the pricing structure of a product? Considering these questions will help you better understand the boundaries of your context and why you might want to separate DB context classes to expose only certain types. So here we now have a whole bunch of different contexts, each which represents a particular focus of the domain, marketing, sales, employee management, each context is responsible only for those classes which live within its boundary. So now I've got a new context class. This one's called Sales Context. And at first glance, it does look like I still have all of the classes in there, but I don't have all of them. And remember that sales is really the core function of this company. So sales does, in fact, involve a lot of different classes. So my Sales Context might have a whole bunch of classes in it. But what about when I'm building the returns part of the application? My context that involves returns only has customers, orders, and returns, because those are the classes that will be involved. But look at this returns context. I don't have a DB set of customer. I have a DB set of customer reference list. 
the more you think about these things, the more you'll be able to perceive models that are bounded by the context in which they'll be used. As you dig further, you start asking yourself, so when do new customers get added? Would someone in the middle of processing return need to create a new customer? Probably not. Rather than hope the developers using your context remember that rule, you can build these types of rules into your context. Unfortunately, the context can't be used for all of these rules. For example, there's no way to remove the add method from dbset, so a developer could still write code that attempts to add a customer during a return. But that's a rule you can implement in a repository, protecting the dbset from activity you don't want performed on it. And the developers would then work with the repository, not directly against the context. In this video, I'll work directly against the context as we learn how to build the bounded context. But another module of this course will be focused on repositories, and then you can see how you can benefit by another layer. Or, taking the question a little further, as you saw with the returns context, when someone returns an item, the user will need access to a customer record, but how much information do they really need about that customer? This will be defined by the domain. Maybe at the company that this application is for, return processing only requires that the user see the customer name and account number and a few details for processing a credit, but they don't need to see lots of detailed data about that customer. In a highly transactional system with potentially lots of concurrent users, you might care a lot about not wasting resources, moving unneeded data across the wire. In entity framework terms, you could create a query that only projects that data that you need. But isn't that silly to have a context where 100% of the time you need customer information, you have to write a projection against it? Why not just have a customer class defined that matches what the domain requires? That's what this customer reference list is. We take a look at the declaration for that. Customer reference list does have the key for the customer, it has the first name and the last name, and it has two fields that give us back the full name as first name, last name, and another property that gives us back a reverse of the full name, last name, comma, first name. And if you look a little more closely at this class, I've given first name and last name private setters so that nobody will get the wrong impression that they can edit these properties. I'd prefer to just make those properties private. And it's possible to do that in code first. You can configure scalar properties so you can have your cake and eat it too, where you can hide the properties from developers, but still let code first see them. However, that requires that I either have to add a code first mapping configuration into my domain class or have the domain class be in the same namespace as the context where it's configured. I'm not a fan of either choice, so I'll just leave these properties public. For those of you who are not that familiar with Code First and conventions for Code First, I do want to point out that the full name and full name reverse fields in this class are defined in a way that they don't map back to the database. Person ID, first name, and last name are properties that are involved in a query and map to something in the database. But full name and full name reverse are simply logic of the class. They have nothing to do with the database. They'll use whatever first name and last name they found to return that data to the client. So how does this customer reference list differ from a customer class? Well, the customer class, remember, inherits from person, and person has all kinds of details in it. So this is another important concept behind domain-driven design. The definition of a customer is different based on the context within the application that I'm using that customer. In a place where I'm doing customer service or I'm doing sales, I might need all of that information, and I might be only viewing it, or I might be adding it, or I might be editing it. But in the context of doing returns, when I talk about a customer, I really only care about their ID and their name. So then, when I'm working with a returns context, I'll work with a customer reference list, and whoever's using this code doesn't even need to know that. They'll just get customers, but they'll get customers defined by the context of, I'm processing return, and to me, a customer is just a person's name. During the design phase, while you're hashing out what are your domain classes, you'll run up against balancing the pros and cons of things like defining another class, like I did with a customer reference list, versus using a common class and creating views over it in your various domains.
a good understanding of domain-driven design, and great communication with your team members and with the domain experts will help you find the balance that works best for your application.